All right, everybody, it's just about one o'clock. So while Jeff gets the slides all set and ready to go, I am going to do the official hello. So hello, welcome to our, our hybrid Earth Festival this year. I'm Amy Wyant, I'm the executive director over here at the Edsigo County Conservation Association. And I don't wanna hold up all of our fun. So I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm very excited for you to be here. And we'll turn it over to Jeff to get things rocking and rolling. Thank you, Amy, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And thank you especially to our presenters uh, for what we're about to see. Um, as Amy said, I'm Jeff O'Handley. I'm the program director for Otsego County Conservation Association. And you know, normally we'd love to have Earth Festival in one big, great gathering, um, maybe next year. Um, so we're just trying the next best thing. Um, I just wanted to, to mention regarding this particular program that I, I decided to call Many Happy Returns. Um, if you're familiar with OCCA at all, you know that we spend a lot of time uh, and effort working on invasive species, but we thought it would be nice to highlight some of the species that folks are trying to bring back, um, either you know, reintroduce into the area or at least to kind of give a give a helping hand to some depleted populations. And uh, that's what uh, today's theme is about. Uh, we're going to start off with Sarah Coney. Sarah is a master's candidate at SUNY Oneonta. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah. So you should be able to share your screen and yep. get us rolling. So like Jeff said, I am a uh, graduate student at SUNY Oneonta and my thesis involves eels in the uh, New York portion of the Upper Susquehanna watershed and quite a few other things that'll be uh, touched upon in some other talks. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, American eels are uh, part of a larger family. There are about 20 species in the world, um, and unfortunately, a lot of them are listed by IUCN, are threatened, um, in peril, and there's been a lot of impact um, on this um, amazing genus throughout the world. So um, they're all freshwater, they're not moray eels, they're not um, typically what most people think of eels, but they're freshwater, and they are found all over the world. Um, so the ones we are talking about today are Anguilla rostrata, um, American eels. And the coolest of the eels, if I might say so. So they are what are called uh, catadromous, which means they spend most of their life in fresh water, but when it is time for them to um, breed, they head out to the Sargasso Sea, which is down by the Bahamas, large floating um, seaweed down in, the, uh, down in the Atlantic. And interestingly enough, eels have never actually been filmed. Um, mating or breeding in the Sargasso, so there's still a lot we don't know about them. We know where they go, but why they go there, what um, timing, what triggers them to go down there, we, there's still a lot we don't know about these amazing um, fish. And what's really interesting is they are panmictic, which means the population um, mixes entirely. So eels that live in freshwater streams up in Canada we'll meet with eels that live in freshwater streams from Central America. And there's no, um, how salmon always return to their birth river. There's nothing with these eels. So an eel that um, parents came from two different places um, can end up somewhere entirely new, not where its parents came from necessarily, um, which is really cool. Interestingly enough, um, European eels, the very close cousin, uh, breeds in the same place. And so there are actually some, uh, some, there's some mixing between them and the mixed eels between American and European actually end up in Iceland, which is very interesting. So it's geographically somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, just thought that was neat. And so they have a really fascinating life cycle and a lot of names. Um, many people might hear them referred to as yellow eels or silver eels or glass eels, which are the com most commercially valuable. And these are all Anguilla rostrata. These are all American eel. They just have different names depending on their life cycle. So they start off um, in the top right, you can see that weird leaf kind of looking thing. That's their planktonic larval form. And it looks nothing like what you would expect an eel to. It's very um, flat, it's very broad uh, when they first start out and they just kind of drift around on the current. 
Eventually, um, they transition to glass eels, which starts to resemble what we think of as an eel a lot more. Um, they're transparent, thus the name glass eel, and they are highly commercially valued. Um, they, can, they are fished um, in Maine and South Carolina, and about a pound of glass eels can sell for upwards of $2,000. Um, so they are, again, very commercially valuable. And eventually, once they start hitting brackish and freshwaters, they transition into elvers, which are, uh, again, look a lot more what we would expect an eel to. Still small, but they start looking more eel-like. And the phase that they spend most of their life in is a yellow, the yellow eel phase. Um, so you can see up at the top, on the top, the right, the yellow-looking eel. It, it is not sexually mature, but that is the phase where they spend most of their life feeding and growing. So if you've ever seen an eel, um, it's most likely, if you've ever caught one, it's a, it was a yellow eel. And this is where coloration in fish gets called into question, because if anybody's a fisherman, you know coloration on fish can be highly variable. So even though we call them yellow eels, they're anywhere between brown and dark gray, and so it, it's very, uh, they vary quite a bit. Um, and once they are sexually mature, they head into the silver eel phase. So this is where they start making their journey back down into the ocean. Um, to breed. Unfortunately, once the eels um, spawn, they die and they leave it to their uh, larvae to make the way back up. So as you can see, they're fairly wide, um, they're fairly spread out all along um, eastern North American and central South American coasts. Um, they're all throughout New York and they are all throughout the Susquehanna watershed. So um, just a little graphic. Um, they end up in the Sargasso, the mature silver eels. Um, leaving the leptocephali to just drift around in currents. Like I said, it's, they don't go back to the same place their parents came from, where they eventually mature and they make very long journeys um, back upstream, up into fresh water. And they have some of the longest um, migrations of any freshwater fish in the world. Um, so these guys do work. They work very hard. Um, and they're important for us. Too. It's, they're not just environmentally, they were historically, economically very important. Um, I've already talked upon the class eels. They're exported to a lot of Asian countries, uh, China and Japan, um, where they grow them because uh, eel, unagi, is traditionally a very um, favored, very um, loved dish. And unfortunately, this has been having an effect on eel populations throughout the world, um, especially Japanese eel populations and um, Europe European eel populations. Um, and that's actually a picture of the Unadilla. So that's one of our local waters. And you can see that V made out of rocks. That's an eel weir. So historically, uh, for many years, um, as silver eels made their way back downstream, um, they were caught in these eel weirs, which kind of funneled them where they would be um, trapped or netted and uh, they were eaten, um, which eel is delicious. If you've ever had it from a sushi restaurant, it really is delicious. <laughs> but unfortunately, our love of eels is really depleted um, stocks. And as a whole, the entire population is on a downward trend, um, unfortunately, um, as classified by Fish and Wildlife and um, a few other organiza organizations. So, um, so let's look at them a bit more focused on New York because we love New York. <laughs> and as you can see, most of the um, most of the sightings are in the Hudson and in the Delaware, um, which there have been great efforts in the Hudson to restore eels. Um, the Delaware is the longest undammed river on the East Coast, I believe. Um, so these have great populations of eels, but if you can see, I don't know if you can see me moving my mouth, um, but if you can see in the Susquehanna, we haven't really had any sightings um, since 1977. So there have not been very many recent sightings of eels, and these were historically very economically and environmentally important. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, that helps highlight the Susquehanna. So um, a little bit more about the Susquehanna, which is right outside um, by front door. It is the second largest basin east of the Mississippi. So this is a very large um, river. It is, again, very important um, historically and still to the surrounding areas. Um, and the Susquehanna, you can find, uh, starts at Otsego Lake, that's the headwaters, um, and it makes its way down through Pennsylvania, Massachusetts before it enters into the Chesapeake Bay. 
And so the biggest trouble these eels are having, besides um, possibly over harvesting, are dams. So hydroelectric power is great, except for when it starts to interfere with the health of the ecosystem. So a lot of diagermous fish, fish that spend most of their life in freshwater or saltwater, depending on their part of the life cycle, um, have trouble coming up uh, Conowingo Dam, uh, co coming up dams throughout the world have uh, been disrupted. So Conowingo Dam is the, at the mouth of the Susquehanna, and it basically creates a significant barrier, seeing as it's 27, almost 90, almost 100 feet tall. Um, but it creates a significant barrier for any migratory fish coming up the Chesapeake Bay into the Susquehanna. And it's been in operation for almost 100 years now. Um, so we're starting to see those effects. And while there has been a lot of uh, recent efforts to ensure um, things like shad and salmon and everything are making, over their, making their way over dams, it's still not quite enough. Um, you can see the circle over there. That's actually an eel ladder that they've put in to help the uh, elvers. Um, make it over the dam as they come back in from the Chesapeake. And so that might be one of the best, the first and the biggest obstacle they have, but there's still quite a few um, that they need to get over just in New York. Um, and I visited quite a few of these and I actually worked at the Goodyear Dam um, last year as an eel passage technician helping eels get over the dam. Because unfortunately these barriers we've made, they can't really get around them um, easily by themselves. And so there's quite a few. Um, and this is just throughout the entire Susquehanna. So first they come to the Conowingo, and then there are uh, every green bar here represents another dam of significant, um, can significantly stop them. So you can see they have quite a few obstacles. And unfortunately, even though things like the South Side Dam aren't even operational, they don't have any hydroelectric, they don't even have any recreational usage, um, they are still left there because it would be more expensive to take them out than it is to maintain them. Um, so unfortunately, these are one of the biggest issues and challenges our eels are facing currently. And eels are important. So I will let Laura talk to you a lot more um, about why exactly they're um, important for these looks like a rock, but <laughs> very environmentally important. And eels um, are the only host for these eastern elliptio that um, allow for successful uh, recruitment of young mussels. Um, so without eels, we are seeing a decline in this population, and again, very important for the environment, for the health of the river. Um, I will let Lord talk about that um, a lot in a lot more detail next, though. Um, so as uh, Jeff mentioned, rusty uh, invasive species are something everybody um, likes to focus on, and interestingly enough, eels have been shown to have a direct impact on one of the more aggressive species found in the Susquehanna River. Um, they've done studies in the Hudson River on eel interactions with rusty crayfish, and they've found that eels are actually a significant predator of rusty crayfish. Um, these are very large, very aggressive crayfish that came from the Ohio River Valley, and they've outcompeted a lot of our native crayfish. Um, they like to rip up a lot of plants um, that basically denude the entire bottom of um, whatever system they're in. And they also prey on the lure of uh, one of our native and protected mussels, Lampsilis cariosa. It's a species of greatest conservation need in New York um, and is listed on IUCN. So you can see up at the top that thing that kind of looks like a fish. That's one of the coolest things about mussels is they have these amazing lures um, because they have parasitic larvae. So they lure in fish, so the fish strike, and they get a face full of, that, of those parasitic um, larvae called guachidia. And unfortunately, the rusty crayfish, they come and they destroy the lures and they not only hurt the mussel's chance of reproduction, they can kill it. Um, which again, this is a vulnerable species, so that's not great. Um, so you can see a better picture um, and uh, everything I just said. Um, they really do have some amazing lures and it would be, these are a native species to the Susquehanna and again, very important for the health of the river. Um, another interesting thing, thing to note, and this is another invasive species um, that is originally found with Japanese eels, um, is the Asian swim bladder nematode. And this affects their, um, this affects the eel's ability to make it back it, to the sargasso to breed. Um, so we've been looking at um, the impacts of this uh, parasite on eels in the Susquehanna and um, infection rates and such. It's, 
it's very interesting. Um, but again, an, another invasive species from Japan, um, halfway around the world. And as I mentioned, eels are one of the best hosts for, um, for Eastern Elliptia. And we don't really understand why. Um, all freshwater pearly mussels have parasitic larvae. They depend on fish to continue their life cycle. And some of them can be very host specific. Um, and we, we just don't have a really great understanding of that. So um, my thesis has been also dealing with looking at why um, these, this specific Eastern Lithia are so specific um, to American eels. Trout work, but as soon as they've been infected once, they develop an immunological response where eels don't. Um, so we would really like to have a better understanding of that because both of these species are very important. And so I am very happy to say, um, as part of my thesis, we have stocked eels in New York for the first time um, ever. Really, I don't think um, it's been recorded um, before. And so we received eels from the Conowingo Dam, um, that eel ladder I showed you earlier. They collect these elbers, and then they truck them upriver. And so this is a picture of the fish container, and you can see all the eels trying to get up. Um, they are very determined, and they're very good at what they do. And so we brought them all the way from um, the Chesapeake Bay at Conowingo, um, all the way up to New York. And so far we've stopped 10,000 in the Shenango and 6,000 in Butternut Creek, um, which are both, again, local rivers that I'm sure some of you have probably visited, um, have done the OCCA paddle down the Butternut because it's a beautiful river. Um, and so these guys have been stocked and we've been trying to keep tabs on them, but eels are mysterious by nature and very hard to find again once they've been released, unfortunately. Um, and so moving forward, we've been working with the Eel Passage Advisory Group um, to facilitate eel movement up across um, throughout the New York watershed, the Susquehanna watershed. Um, and we've been focused mostly on the Butternut, Charlotte Creek, and um, the Shenango River um, near Sanger Field. And we've been moving forward. Um, that's what we've been focusing on in 2020, and we will continue focusing on that in 2021 because unfortunately COVID put a little uh, bit of a kibosh on our plans, as I'm sure um, many of you were affected in similar ways. Um, and we'll also be looking to utilize something called eDNA, which is a really neat technique, um, environmental DNA, where we take a water sample, and it basically um, can tell us if there are eels present in the system or not, because traditional sampling methods with eels are tricky, um, to say the least. So um, this has been a great effort um, by a lot of partners, um, a lot of people we've been working with. As you can see, this is a long list of people to thank. Um, Butternut Valley Association is, again, a great help. Um, I don't know if anybody's here, but um, they've always been great. OCCA, uh, um, thank you for letting me talk about my eels. And if you have any interest in getting um, involved, I always need help. <laughs> so, and I like to think we have fun. It's fun, um, especially the eels. They're very cute if you've never actually seen them up close. They are quite cute. So um, if you ever have any questions or want to contact me, please feel free, um, email or um, call me. And I think, we, do we have time for questions? Or did I talk too much? No, no, you're fine. Um, okay. what, I, what I realized that I had forgotten to do, of course, is, is to say at the beginning that what we would do is open up for questions for a few minutes for each presenter as they go and then also have a second, you know, general in case other things came up. So, so thank you very much, Sarah. And I was, I, I, what I would ask, um, if you could either go back one slide or, uh, yep, there we go. And that way, if anybody wants to write down that contact information for you because that was one of my questions for you was what um you know if, if people wanted to get involved what what opportunities and and what would they do how what sort of volunteer work would they be able to do for you um so uh a lot of my work recently has involved um searching for juvenile eastern elliptio um because as we've released the eels we expect to see um, more elliptio in these beds that we've already marked in 2018 and so basically I've been going out and I've been um, thieving for looking for these juvenile muscles while also keeping tabs on um, the muscle, the older muscles themselves. Um, there's also, we're again hoping to truck up more eels from the Conowingo. So if people um, like last year, or I don't know what year it is anymore, 
Um, but when we released them in the Butternut, a lot of um, volunteers from the Butternut Valley Association came to meet us to help us um, release the eels, which was awesome. Um, looking for the eels, if anybody ever catches one, please let me know. Um, I'd be very interested. Um, or if anybody's just seen one recently, I would, again, love to know. Um, so there's, there's quite a few opportunities if you're not afraid of getting wet. Okay, I think a lot of people here are, are not. And I know that Ed is here, at least from, uh, from BVA, so there. Uh, we did have uh, another question, and I, I think you did touch on this, but the question was about what are glass eels used for? Oh, um, so yeah, they're collected um, in Maine and South, um, South uh, Carolina are the only two um, glass eel fisheries in the United States. Um, there's quite a few in uh, Canada, as I understand, though. And so the glass eels are collected, um, sold for, like I said, $2,000 a pound of these little tiny things. Um, and they are shipped over to Asian cultures where they are grown to a size um, that is more suitable for eating. Um, so they culture them to a larger size. Very nice. Okay. That, and, and I did have one other uh, quick question for you. So, so yeah. you've stocked about 16,000 eels in, in the area, correct? Mm -hmm. And is there any idea at this point what sort of survival rate you're seeing or, or we're not quite there yet. Like I said, recapture is exceedingly difficult, especially when we're releasing them. They're like, I don't know if that really gives you good perspective, but mm -hmm. they're tiny. Yep. Um, and they, they do grow quite fast in their first couple of years of life, especially, um, I didn't say this, but um, male American eels only spend a few years in the um, system. It's females that can spend upwards of 20, 30 years and can get four feet long. Um, so they, they can spend quite a while in the system and they grow pretty fast, but again, they're very hard to find um, using traditional survey methods like electroshocking, um, especially since they're nocturnal and they like to hide and they like to be difficult. So um, unfortunately, we don't have too much marker capture data for them at the moment. Understood. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and again, if folks have questions for Sarah later on, we'll be able to answer them at the end. And, and again, thank you very much. And now we will move on to Paul Lord. Thank you, everybody who is, uh, uh, ha has joined us today. You honor us by your interest in these organisms. Um, certainly, pearly mussels, uh, living rocks, as you can see on the lower right there, or, or slimy yeah. eels are not the iconic uh, organisms that we typically associate with with uh, Earth Day and celebrating the diversity of life on Earth. So all of you that showed up today to hear about my living rocks, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, my name is Lord. I'm a, uh, a scientist who uh, works at uh, SUNY Oneonta as a researcher and a lecturer. I uh, do a lot of work with aquatic plants, particularly the biocontrol of aquatic plants. I also, of course, do work with pearly mussels, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, I am deaf, so there may be a little pause while other people are texting me your questions when, when it comes time for questions. Um, yeah, I do not have a terminal degree, and that's why Jeff was stumbling around how to address me. I chastise my students if they call me doctor or professor because I'm not either, I'm a lecturer. What's clear is that my focus, my science is all about uh, the environment that's cold, wet, and oftentimes muddy. And uh, today I'm, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you about the work that we've done in the Susquehanna in New York State, about some of our pearly muscle surveys, why pearly mussels are important even to human uh, consideration, and then a little bit about some of the species of greatest conservation need we find in the Susquehanna, and finally the eastern liptio, the very mussel that Sarah was talking about with its connection to the, uh, to the American eel. Any questions on the roadmap? Not seeing any questions. Let me say that uh, for three years, I was a full-time muscle surveyor. From 28 until 2010, I did nothing except 
survey these 206 miles of uh, uh, New York Susquehanna River, uh, looking for pearly mussels and trying to ident identify the habitats that were still holding pearly mussels, trying to correlate that with ancient records of pearly mussels. And as you might imagine, after three years, we, uh, we, we thought we had a lot to say about them. And um, boiling that down, the focus of our work from the beginning was on species of greatest conservation need in New York. And we had found four of, actually five species of greatest conservation need in the, uh, in the Susquehanna, um, four that still persist. The brook floater, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And then the elk toe, which perhaps is our most beautiful uh, pearly mussel. The green floater, which those are my fingers there, so, and that's a big one. So the green floater rarely is bigger than an inch and a half in, in size. Real challenge to find it. I think you can see which part of that animal was buried in the substrates and which part was sticking out. So typically, we're only seeing a quarter to a half inch of animal sticking out of the substrates. If, if any part of it is sticking out of the substrates when we're looking for the green floater, real challenge to find them. And then finally, the yellow lamp mussel, which Sarah uh, described to you um, when she was showing you that mating lure. Mussels spend their entire lives in our rivers and streams, and in some places still in our lakes and ponds. They can move inches a day. That's fast for a pearly mussel, which means that they are right in the way when pollution is coming at them. They are there when the water is low. They're there when the water is raging high. They're there when the water is warm. They're there when there's ice on top of the water. And they're long lived. The Eastern Liptio that I'm focusing uh, on is a pearly mussel that can live in excess of 100 years. So uh, our survey, we're trying to boil down habitat likes and dislikes, where we found pearly mussels in numbers uh, that might come close to approaching the numbers that used to be commonly found throughout the Susquehanna watershed when I was a youngster. And we found those areas to be areas with oxygenated waters and minimally mobile substrates. Perhaps not surprisingly, since pearly mussels have a shell that's basically basically largely calcium carbonate, uh, if the rocks are rolling around, the rocks are going to crack and dent and penetrate those uh, pearly mussel shells. So minimally mobile substrates. And, and we found those minimally mobile substrates were most common in areas where we had wooded swamps on one side or the other of the stream or river. And um, even better if we had a riffle upstream to oxygenate the water before it came into it. And so one of the places that we identified as a, a wonderful pearly mussel habitat is this area um, over by Owego where we have brook floaters. And what you are seeing there is inside those yellow lines is wooded swamp and in the center of it is a stream in which we find brook floaters and eastern elliptios and a number of other species of pearly mussels that are more commonly found in the in the area so those were our original surveys since then we have done surveys repeatedly on the Unadilla um, for reasons that I'll come back to in a moment, the Catatonk Creek, Tioga River, Cherry Valley Creek, Oaks Creek, oh, and, uh, oh, yes, the west branch of the Teofnioga River. Oh, we've been around. <laughs> 
we have looked at now over 400 miles of uh, New York State Susquehanna River waters for pearly mussels. So one of the species of greatest conservation need that we identified there was the uh, brook floater. I'd like to talk about the brook floater for just a little bit. Uh, the brook floater is threatened in New York. It is uh, listed in almost every state where it occurs now. It used to be very common in the Delaware River and the Susquehanna River, and we're not really sure why it is uh, now threatened in New York. What we do know is that the population is much reduced and isolated little pockets where the brook floater lives, such as this location here on the Catatonk Creek that, uh, that we were just, that I, I discussed that had the uh, wooded swamp around the outside, which appears to protect this small, fragile animal from raging waters. Additionally, um, in that spot was at least initially a good number of Eastern Elliptia. The brook floater is an incredibly sensitive uh, pearly mussel and thereby a great indicator of exemplary water quality. We do find hybrid brook floaters still in other places in the Susquehanna. And we are unaware of any other location where these hybrids exist. The hybrid is between the brook floater and the oak toe. Uh, elk toe here, the Tsara is uh, it, it just grabbed just a couple of months ago. In this location in the Susquehanna with the most brook floaters, we have a population that we've estimated at about 40 animals. The brook floater doesn't live nearly as long as the Eastern Elliptio. It only lives about 10, 12 years. The Reproduction has been documented by others to be intermittent. That is, some years it'll reproduce well and other years not at all. We've seen the same thing here in the Catatonk River. The Catatonk had a dam that was failing, that was threatening to blow out the, all of these brook floaters. We were heavily involved in a project that extended for 12 years that resulted in the dam being taken down last summer. We will go back this summer and see if the work was done correctly and if the brook floaters are actually persisting there. So that dam that's holding back that uh, uh, lake behind the dam is now gone and the lake has been restored to wetland status. And hopefully the brook floaters are still in the location where they were and they will have even more habitat to uh, spread out into because they were confined to an area of about 300 feet um, with, the, with the dam there. This is uh, a table from one of our reports on the brook floater work, trying to uh, understand how many, how the population was doing. And you see that the brook floater numbers were relatively stable there actually seemed to increase somewhat. There was a little bit of reproduction between 2011 and 2015. But in that same period, look what happened to the Eastern Elliptio. And you might wonder why. Well, it comes back to what Sarah had to tell you about the Eastern Elliptio. The Eastern Elliptio um, needs eels to reproduce. There are no eels up there in this part of the watershed and our eastern elliptios are aging out at 70 to 100 years. They are one by one seeing their shells eroded and once they're eroded all sorts of uh, organisms come in and prey on them. Now, this is a, a, an eastern elliptio. Eastern elliptios are not species of greatest conservation need. So you might wonder why I'm focused on them. And 
And here are some of those shells that have been eroded. That is a normal uh, death for many of these eastern lithios. Normally happens, as I said, between 70 and 100, 110, 120 years. This is not normal. These are a mixed bag of pearly mussels, most of which are eastern lithio. Uh, some members in the audience have heard me talk about this unfortunate set of uh, circumstances that occurred about 10 years ago, where whey from the Chobani plant was spread too close to our rivers, and in particular the Unadilla River. And we had uh, hundreds and hundreds, thousands actually, of dead pearly mussels. We're, we're still pulling pearly mussels, uh, spent shells out of Unadilla River when we visit there from this big uh, killing that occurred with the, with the way. Pearly mussels reproduce, uh, as, as Sarah showed you with her pictures, by infecting the gills of fish with their young larvae. And the, the uh, necessary host in the New York Susquehanna is the American eel. That was documented by some good work coming out of the USGS, the US Geological Survey. We've done some work since then, looking at whether our really old pearly mussels here in the New York Susquehanna are still capable of reproducing. And, and, and we tagged a bunch of mussels and came back and revisited them, figured out which ones were males and which ones were females. We took samples from them at a couple of different times over the summer. We did find eggs being produced in the females and sperm in the males and later on glycidia. So we do know that the Eastern Elliptio are capable of reproducing, which then led to a, a, a final decision by New York State DEC to allow us to stock the eels that Sarah has been working with. Why am I so focused on the Eastern Elliptio? I still haven't answered that. So let me tell you that the Eastern Elliptio was once so common that you were hard pressed to walk local rivers and streams and cross them while trout fishing without stepping on them. Nobody even gave them a thought they were so ter uh, common. That isn't the case anymore. When those Eastern Elliptios were that common, they changed the way the water flowed over the bottom of our rivers and streams. So what I'm going to talk about is a bit of physics, and it really has to do with friction. When water flows next to a surface, the friction of the rubbing of the water against that surface slows down its velocity. And when that water uh, moves further away from a surface, the velocity maintains itself. If look, looking at this particular picture, and uh, we're looking at a flow that's moving from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen, there is slow movement around this irregular surface. This particular surface looks more like a rock, but it could very well be a pearly muscle. The fact is, as the water flows over the top of that rock or pearly muscle, on the downstream side of it, there is quiet water. That is important because our small species of greatest conservation need, in particular the two threatened species, the brook floater and the green floater, are too small to both be accessing the water for their food and oxygen and to stay well planted in the substrates unless they are in quiet water, but they need moving water to have oxygen and that Goldilocks location is oftentimes between our Eastern Elliptios. So the Eastern Elliptios form pearly mussel beds and then our species of greatest conservation need can 
populate those pearly muscle beds and move into areas where right now they're not capable of surviving. So what are we looking for? We're looking for support for enhanced protection for uh, Susquehanna watershed rivers and streams. We find that support certainly in the butternut. This is a picture in the butternut. Uh, other places, not so much. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, so I won't make too much of, of, of my plea for protecting of our rivers and streams, but we need that. We also, of course, need support for stocking of these American eels and releases in far more places than we've been able to do so far. I'd be happy to entertain some questions now. I never felt comfortable lecturing to the camera. I'd be happy to, to see some faces, hear some voices. There we go. Uh, that, that's actually really interesting, Paul, that, that link between um, the Eastern Elliptios and, and the others. I, very interesting. I, I do have a question. What, what sort of impact are you seeing from you know, like ecotourism activities on mussel populations. Has, has there been one or you know, from the, <laughs> the rise of canoeing and kayaking and such or? Well, uh, and we, we discuss this uh, frequently. I'm not sure that I'm pleased or disappointed that so many people can look right at a pearly mussel and not recognize that it is in fact something other than a rock on the bottom. Uh, the good news there is they're much less likely to do anything to disturb the pearly mussel. The bad news is they're much less likely to be protective of these organisms because they don't recognize that they're any different from rocks. So I would be happy to uh, educate people that had a sincere interest in protecting these animals. And as Sarah has said, we frequently are looking for folks to help us with our surveys. And that's a great way for you to learn the difference between rocks and uh, pearly mussels on the bottom of our rivers and streams. And if uh, folks did want to help you out with the surveys, what would be the best way for them to, to do that, to get in contact with you? Whoops. There we go. There we go, yeah. We'll, we'll leave that up there. Does anybody else have any other questions for Paul? We'll give them, um, oh, here we go. Leslie does. Uh, you know what, maybe I can, uh, Leslie, I'm going to allow you to talk if you have a microphone going on since we're a small group. Unmute. You okay. are unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can. We can. Thank Hi. You. Hi. Um, so my question is, you said that the elliptios um, provide shelter on the, on the backside from turbulence. Can, um, have you seen if zebra mussel clumps provided that same shelter? I mean, I know we don't like zebra mussels very much, but they could conceivably yeah. provide that same shelter, right? Uh, they, they could, but they're in, uh, inappropriate size to do so. Even a whole clump of them? Uh, I'm not disallowing the possibility. All the bissel threads uh, could help to hold the bottom together, which would stabilize some habitat that would perhaps allow for appropriate water flow over the top of these uh, protected species, these species of greatest conservation need. But mm -hmm. as soon as you have that many zebra mussels, we have direct competition between the zebra mussels and the pearly mussels for the exact same food. Additionally, zebra mussels in particular, their larvae like to settle out on substrates that have 
lots of calcium in them. So typically they settle out near the, the opening on the pearly muscle, what we call the posterior end, where the siphons come out. And they immediately are competing mouth to mouth with the pearly muscles for the water that is coming to the pearly muscle. Finally, when enough of the zebra muscles end up on that posterior end of the pearly muscle, they have enough of a biomass that, and they extend the structure of the pearly muscle with its zebra muscles up into the current far enough that when the water surges a little bit, the pearly muscle ends up getting ripped out of the sediments. So Eastern elliptios and other big pearly muscles are starved and then ultimately ripped out of the sediments by colonization by zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are a major issue for pearly mussels, particularly in our lakes and ponds. In our rivers and the streams, the problem for the zebra mussel is finding a foothold long enough that they can attach. So we find areas in our rivers and streams where we see uh, blankets of zebra mussels the way we see them around the edges of our lakes and ponds, but we also find vast areas of our rivers and streams with few or no zebra mussels and uh, remnants of our pearly mussel population still in them. All right, well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, we may have some more questions for you at the very end. Greatly right. appreciate it. Um, finally, for, for this uh, particular presentation, we have Michelle Herman. Michelle is a biological technician for the Wetland Trust uh, and is a graduate ah. student at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, Michelle, we turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Let me pull this up. All right. Um, thank you again for having me. And yeah, I'd like to talk about the um, another conservation initiative going on in the Upper Susquehanna River watershed, which is um, saving the snot otter, as I like to say, um, Eastern Hellbender Conservation. Um, first, I'm going to go over some background about the hellbender because this is a creature that um, many people have probably not seen. They're very elusive, as I'll talk about. Um, and then I'm going to go into this um, project that we've been working on. Um, it's been in the works for a long time, but um, the work that I'll be overviewing today um, started around 2017 and continues to this day. So without further ado, I'm going to start with just dispelling um, a few misunderstandings and uh, misinformation about the hellbender because, as I said, this is probably a creature that um, you haven't encountered, especially in central New York, where they're not very common. Um, so what isn't a hellbender? Um, a lot of people think that they're poisonous or venomous or, um, you know, their fierce appearance um, makes them look aggressive to some people or their size is startling, but they're, they're harmless to humans. And uh, there was also a myth that they were um, voracious predators of trout eggs and um, other sport fish, which is not true, which I'll talk about um, in a few slides. And then uh, a third point that I want to bring up um, right at the get-go is that a lot of people confuse the hellbender with the mud puppy, which is an entirely different species of aquatic salamander. Um, that, the mud puppy is Nectaris maculosus, the hellbender is Cryptobranchus alleghaniensis, so two totally different species. They do look similar. Uh, mud puppies are a bit smaller. They typically go up to about 13 inches on average. Hellbenders get up to about two feet. And uh, mud puppies are a little more common throughout New York. You're more likely to encounter this salamander. Um, they're a little less picky about where they live. They can be found in streams and lakes and reservoirs. 
And uh, there's some morphological differences, mainly the mud puppy, as you can see on the left, has external gills, which hellbenders lose when they're about two years old. And the hellbender has these uh, wrinkly body folds on the sides, which you can maybe see in the photo, and that is mainly what they use for respiration. So they breathe through their skin, and that's to increase surface area for breathing through their skin. Um, so that's pretty much what a hellbender isn't. And uh, I mentioned some other common names um, that they've gone by over the years, which includes snot otter, lasagna lizard, double dog, or Allegheny alligator. And uh, in the 19th and 18th centuries, um, people actually referred to hellbenders more often as alligators, which is um, kind of interesting. And just a little bit of context. So um, the family that hellbenders belong to is Cryptobranchidae. And I like to call them a small family of giants because right now there are only three exant species, if you don't count all of the subspecies. So we have the hellbender, and we have the Chinese giant salamander and the Japanese giant salamander, and that is it. So um, salamanders in this family are distributed just in Eastern North America and China and Japan. And that's a whole other story as to how that happened. But um, this is a pretty impressive family. Um, the Chinese giant salamander is the largest salamander in the world. They can get up to about six feet max, although they, they tend to not grow that large um, these days, but there's massive farming operations in China. And uh, the hellbender, as you can see in the uh, lower left there, I'm holding what is one of our larger adults at our reintroduction site, um, which kind of pales in comparison to uh, the upper right photo, which is a Chinese giant salamander. Um, so this is a, a pretty wild family of salamanders and um, we're really lucky to have these animals in our watershed, I think, just from that standpoint alone. And now if we zoom in on the hellbenders distribution in eastern North America, you can see in the range map that it's uh, closely associated with the Appalachian Mountains and the Ozark Mountains over in Missouri, which is where the Ozark subspecies resides. Um, but where we are at in the upper Susquehanna River watershed is the northern limit of the Hellbenders Range, the eastern Hellbenders Range. And um, the other little spur that is going into New York is the Allegheny River watershed, where they also occur. But between the two watersheds, um, there are fewer records of Hellbenders in this watershed. Um, they go back to the early 1900s. Um, there's about two dozen historical sites that have been documented in this entire watershed. So we really don't know much about them, their historical distribution. Um, but there are several limiting factors to hellbenders in this northern part of their range, which um, I'll touch on in a few slides. Now further zooming in, so if we look at where exactly within that distribution do hellbenders occur? Um, these animals prefer mountainous streams that have an abundance of large flat rocks. They like well-shaded channels, cold, highly oxygenated water. So they, again, breathe through their skin, so they need very high quality water in order to maintain um, their respiration. And um, they're typically going to be found in larger creeks and smaller rivers, about third or fourth order streams, if you're familiar with that concept. So um, the stream needs to be able to run year round. Um, they need, uh, as I said, high dissolved oxygen. Um, they're very sensitive to fine sediment. And uh, people always wanna know what they eat. And in the lower left, you can see um, that is their main prey item, which is crayfish which um, they prey on by the, uh, their suction feeders. So they, they wait in ambush for a crayfish to crawl by and they suck them in, swallow them whole, and they can digest the entire crayfish, which is uh, pretty amazing. But that is their primary food source. They will also eat other small fishes and macroinvertebrates opportunistically, but 
Um, first and foremost, they feed on crayfish. And as far as what eats hellbenders, they're typically pretty tough to get to. They, they tend to stay under their rock for most of their life. Um, but there have been a few documented instances of predation, which you can see in the upper right, that is a river otter um, preying on an adult hellbender. So uh, we do have otters in this watershed and in the stream where we're working, um, but we don't have evidence of predation so far. Other predators might include raccoons or great blue heron or mink, but um, it's, again, it's really rare to um, see hellbender predation. It's, it's, they're usually just not very accessible. And when it does happen, um, it's probably at night when researchers aren't around. And as far as the life cycle goes, um, in New York, uh, there is a, about a month long egg stage. Um, as far as size goes, you can maybe think of, um, it's like a small strand of, it, or rather a, a long strand of small grapes, about a grape sized egg um, when it's fully mature. And then after about a month, the larvae hatch out. Um, they're just these tiny little things an inch or so long and the uh, golden part there, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that is the yolk sac that they feed off of initially. Um, and they have gills for about two years. And uh, after about two years, the gills are absorbed and they essentially um, look like miniature adults. They enter into the small T or juvenile stage. And then when they're about five or six years old, they reach maturity and they're considered adults. And as an adult, they may live for another 20 plus years. Um, we suspect that they can easily live over 30 years in the wild and in captivity, I believe they've gotten up to about 50 years old. So they are, are an incredibly long lived amphibian. And uh, interestingly, the male is the one that guards the eggs, which I should mention. So he will stay behind after the female has deposited the eggs and he guards them. They lay their eggs in the fall and he will stay with them throughout the winter. And he, uh, he'll usually um, guard the entrance to the chamber under the rock and he keeps the eggs aerated. So uh, it's a pretty incredible longevity and um, it's a really cool animal, I think. So uh, I mentioned before, hellbenders are fairly limited in the upper Susquehanna River watershed. And uh, we don't really know historically how prevalent they were, but we do know that they are definitely stressors in this watershed that have led to a decline since at least the 1980s, as far as we can tell. So this is a, as you may know, this is a highly agricultural watershed. Um, which can lead to increased bank erosion. You know, if um, row crops are planted right to the edge of waterways, um, and then that increases sedimentation in the waterways, which smothers hellbender habitat. Um, it eliminates those interstitial spaces that young hellbenders need in gravel and cobble, and then smothers the larger slab rocks that older juveniles and adults use. And uh, as you also probably know, this is a somewhat flashy watershed. We've had some pretty dramatic flooding, um, which also uh, moves the rock around. It can eliminate habitat patches and um, that can be hard on hellbenders as well. And we have, um, of course, pollution issues and other detriments to water quality. And in the center, Sarah already touched on this, but that is the rusty crayfish which has been invading this watershed for the past several decades. And uh, we're not so much concerned about the hellbender not eating this crayfish over a native crayfish, but we suspect that they may be preying on younger life stages. So the eggs or the larval hellbenders may be vulnerable to rusty crayfish. And that brings us to um, the reintroduction work that we're doing. So in 2013 and 2014, there is a very comprehensive survey of the entire watershed done. 
It was the most, probably the most thorough surveys done to date, just as far as um, the scope of the work and all of the methods that were utilized. There was rock lifting, eDNA, camera scoping and trapping. And only one hellbender was caught in that entire effort. It was a male guarding a nest at a, in a uh, tributary. So eggs were collected from that clutch and uh, taken to the Bronx Zoo for safekeeping. And um, that was kind of um, the impetus of this project was what can we do? In this population went from about at least 25 individuals in the mid 90s down to the single male guarding a nest in 2014 with uh, no other sightings in the watershed between 2013 and 2014. So what we wanted to attempt was to restore this historical tributary site and augment the population with these juveniles that were collected as eggs. So the, the first step, um, before you can reintroduce all of these hellbenders, um, you need to make sure that there's enough habitat to support this big influx of animals. So we wanted to make sure that there is enough shelter for these released hellbenders. And in 2018, and again in 2020, we installed slab rock, um, which you may know as bluestone. We sourced this from the southern tier, um, trucked it in, we lined it up on the bank, and we used a number of uh, machines that our partners at the Upper Susquehanna Coalition were instrumental in moving this rock around for us. We also had volunteers from DEC, the Butternut Valley Alliance, um, Lycoming College, and a number of volunteers that came out to help us, which was fantastic because this is a, a huge effort to move all this rock into the channel. So we used uh, forklifts, carrier crawlers, excavators, anything that we could to, to move the, these massive slabs. And the end result, um, was that we essentially bridged about a 250 meter gap between two reaches that had some natural habitat, but there is this, this long stretch in between with just nothing but silt and fine gravel and cobble. So we're hoping that this will um, support future releases of hellbenders and sort of serve as a bridge between these two um, historical reaches that already had some natural habitat. And the second part to the habitat enhancement was these artificial shelters that we build. Um, as we call them huts. They're made out of concrete. Um, this is a very much a DIY approach. We pour the concrete around a handmade wooden mold in a wooden frame. And we um, attach these ABC plastic parts that serve as a, uh, there's an observation port on top for us. And then on the side, there's the entrance for the hellbender to get into the chamber. And we have two sizes, um, one for adults, one for juveniles. And we place these among the, uh, the slab rocks that we placed in between the two historical reaches at this site, but we also put huts within the historical reaches themselves to augment the natural rock. And these are um, a very popular thing right now in hellbender conservation. They're used throughout the hellbenders range. Um, Missouri were um, sort of the pioneers in this. There's a few different designs out there right now, but this has been a fairly successful design for us. And uh, we had our enhanced historical site. So that brings us to the captive rearing. So the next step was to augment the population at the site. And uh, we didn't want to just rear the hellbenders and release them. We wanted to answer some questions about maybe why they were declining if we could. So uh, we wanted to bring in local water and food sources to see if there is possibly a link between them and the hellbender population crash that we saw in the watershed, which is a, a lot of work. The photos here are showing you how we, we literally went to a stream and we withdrew water onto these big tanks 
and uh, took it back to our lab facility. I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. And the crayfish, we went out and uh, just went out with seines and caught them directly from the creek. Um, the photo there is a, um, a group of volunteers that came up from the Chesapeake Bay from um, Leadership Council, um, really great group of kids, really enthusiastic. And uh, the other part of the captive rearing too is that um, this is being done in a lot of other states, but there is a the overwhelming uh, methodology right now is to keep hellbenders in highly sterile rearing environments for years, right up until release. So they're not exposed to um, very many native food sources or um, you know water directly from the intended release site. So we we had the opportunity to to kind of um, compare different rearing strategies as well, as far as just looking at local factors into their decline. So this is the, uh, in the bottom right there is the actual rearing facility. This is owned by the Wetland Trust um, right in New Berlin. And uh, we were, we had this set up as six separate systems where we could deliver these various water source and diet treatments. And uh, in order to assess the effects of um, the water and the diet, we did monthly assessments. We were able to track individuals by giving them a temporary fluorescent tag, which you can see in the photo. So we were able to tell which individual was which in each tank. We had about three to four hellbenders per tank. And uh, you can see um, in the lower left there, that's um, how we would process them. We just measure them in these custom built boards. We would weigh them and we swab them for chytrid, which is another stressor that I forgot to mention earlier. It's a, a devastating amphibian um, global pandemic for amphibians um, that's wiping out a lot of populations worldwide, but particularly in the tropics. And um, this is something that we test for in hellbenders as well, even though hellbenders typically don't show external symptoms. So after about a year and the experimental rearing, we released 99 individuals when they were three and a half years old. We brought them to the creek in these aerated coolers and put them in these soft release units for two weeks. So we wanted to supervise their acclimation to the creek. And uh, so we temporarily held them in this um, hut slash enclosure setup. And when the two weeks was up, we removed the wire mesh enclosure and they were allowed to roam freely. And the monitoring that we do has three main components. So initially we had a um, passive monitoring system with these two cables that formed a loop across the cable. And uh, before we released the hellbenders, they all received a permanent pit tag, which you can see in the inset photo next to the dime for scale. So that was how we permanently marked them with their own ID. And uh, anytime a tagged hellbender would crawl across those cables, you can see in the upper left photo, um, the system would record the time and the ID. And we had a sense based on whether it was at the upstream or the downstream system, which direction they were going after they were released because we wanted to know if they were staying at the site. And then the other two parts to our monitoring is um, every year we try to capture them at least once to give them a health assessment. We swab them for chytrid. And the, the device that I'm holding in the bottom right is our tag reader. So that reads right through the rocks. It, it works kind of like a metal detector. It, it will um, tell you if you have a tagged animal under the rock. So we monitor their location and their movements. Um, so as of 2020, we're finding that they have very high su survivorship. Um, there's about 20% of the cohort remaining at the site um, as of 2020, which doesn't sound like it's very impressive, but as far as wildlife releases go, this is, this is a very high percentage um, of survival. So we're very thrilled about that. And they're also, um, they seem very healthy. They're 
clearly feeding well, they're thriving out there, and they are making use of the placed slab rock and the huts that we provided for them, which we're also happy about. And uh, one last thing to touch on before I move on to future work is that we made some really cool discoveries while monitoring for the released juveniles, um, and that is there were uh, there's some more adults um, out there that we didn't know about. So we're up to um, about 12 tagged wild adults at this point, um, just by checking the huts that we placed, which is really thrilling. And, uh, but we're still not seeing wild juveniles out there and we're still not seeing larval hellbenders um, out in the, the wild too. So. Um, and a lot of these animals are probably over 25 years old, so there's still a recruitment issue for sure. But just by checking our huts, we were able to find a dozen additional adult hellbenders that nobody knew was there. Was in the previous 25 years or so, there were only about um, three adults captured in this reach by uh, lots of rock lifting. And the other half of that is that these adults that we're finding are nesting in our huts, which is great because we can collect a small portion of the eggs and continue head starting. So we have another batch at the Bronx Zoo right now um, that we're hoping to bring into the TWT lab this year. And uh, we want to keep collecting some of the eggs because um, we know now that the larvae the eggs develop normally and the larvae hatch in the wild, but we have no idea what happens to them once they disperse. Um, we're not sure what is happening in that life stage. There just seems to be a, um, a bottleneck occurring, you know, between the young larval to young juvenile stage, and we're not sure what happens to them. Um, so we want to continue egg collection through these huts. And that brings us to the future work. As I said, uh, we want to continue captive rearing and trying um, more experimental approaches to see if we can figure out if there are environmental factors limiting, limiting hellbenders in this watershed. And uh, we want to do a few more releases because uh, we really need to bring in multiple age classes to this population. Because right now, as I said, we're limited to mostly very old adults um, uh, with no wild juveniles. And we also will continue the field monitoring. So I'll be out there again this year searching for our released juvenile hellbenders. And we're also trying new things like um, putting tag readers on individual huts. And uh, we want to redeploy our stationary tag readers uh, when we release this next cohort. And yeah, we have a lot of just uh, wonderful partners on this project. Um, the list is very long to go through, but um, we've been very fortunate to have um, just wonderful partners like the Bronx Zoo that does the initial rearing and the TWT that um, hosts the lab and um, just lots of great volunteers as well. And with that, um, this is my contact information. Um, if you have additional questions that we don't get to today, or if you've seen a hellbender, um, please contact me. I would love to hear um, any sightings that you've had of this creature. And um, thank you guys for having me. Well, thank you, Michelle. It was very interesting. Um, do, and if we do have questions, um, I guess, you know, either just say a note in the Q&A, we, we should be able to, we're a small group, so we could unmute people as we did for Leslie before and allow people to ask questions. I, I am curious, actually, um, with the older adults that you're finding um, that, that, that were wild in the, in the stream, are, are they, do you know that it, when they get older like that, or do they, you know, see a fertility drop or, you know, is it reproduction, lack of reproduction potentially because there's so few of them or any ideas on that or? Yeah, for sure. Um, part of the issue is that there's just not many uh, breeding pairs out there right now, not enough to sustain the population. Um, we had a maximum of three nests 
in one season. So we, we've been finding one to three nests per fall so far. And um, yeah, like they, they will continue to reproduce when they get older, but um, there is the issue, I, I believe, when they, they reach a certain point that the fertility probably does drop a little bit. Um, but I, I think the, the major issue by far is just there's, there's not enough out there to, to sustain the population. Okay. And then in terms of, uh, you know, aside from the obvious, like you've seen a hellbender, you know, get a picture and a location and let you know, is, are there opportunities for people to volunteer or to help out with the project in any sort of way? Yeah, um, we do a monthly processing, like I said, of the juveniles. Um, it would possibly be good to, to have a few volunteers help with that, um, measure some squirming little hellbenders all day. Sounds um, fun. <laughs> and uh, we're planning to, we'll probably continue to add more rock. I'm not sure when we would do that next, but it's always great to have as many people as possible when we install the slab rock, because that takes a lot of manpower. And, sure. Well, I, I would say let us know, and you know, yeah. we'll see if we can get, get folks to help you out for that, certainly, as well. Um, yeah. Um, was there something else I, I wanted to ask about about that? Now I do recall seeing some pictures from like the Daily Star, the, the you know the newspaper up here from the '60s of of people having caught like large numbers of hellbenders. Um, you don't typically see them being caught by fishermen, do you? Or oh, I actually, know mud puppies will 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 take the bait sometimes, but I'm pretty sure the pictures I saw were hellbenders that people were actually fishing out of the Susquehanna near Oneonta. Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they get caught on fishermen's lines for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, I mean, there, um, I've seen articles going back to the 1930s of fishermen uh, reporting, you know, getting a hellbender on the line and they're um, maybe understandably pretty freaked out. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, they have no idea what it is. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's a, somewhat common yeah okay. and and i guess is there any education work that you're doing for folks you know to so that you know when if if the population starts to increase that you know to let people know that they may be coming you know coming across these things and not to freak out or anything yeah i mean that the uh we're hoping to do more outreach this year um obviously last year it was um, a little tricky to, to do that, but in years past, we have hosted um, outreach events here at the lab where people could come and hear about hellbenders and tour the lab, um, which we would like to do again at, at some point. Um, but yeah, I would say my, my main message to people would just be to not move rocks and, um, you know, don't be afraid if you catch one on your line, just try to get it off your line if you can and put it back in the water and, you know, if it's not going to harm you. And actually the, the work that you're doing reminded me of a question I wanted to ask Paul. Um, and that was about the potential of artificial uh, substrate for the muscles when you, you know, you were talking before about how the, you know, um, I'm, my notes are bad. Um, but with the Eastern Elliptio and, and that, is there any potential to use artificial substrates to help out there? That, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Jeff. Uh, it, it speaks to the uh, essential need for these living muscles to provide the boundary layer effect for other muscles. So, when the rivers roar, when the water is high, rocks roll, muscles burrow. Mm -hmm. So if we try to put artificial substrates in, the river roars, the artificial substrate gets blown away. The eastern lyptios are there. When the river starts to go up, the muscles burrow down as do the other muscles living um, in contact with them, in close proximity to them. 
And so they're both responding to the dropping of water levels to come up out of the substrates and the rising water levels to burrow down into them. <clears throat> okay, seems like a good idea, but <laughs> obviously it's more complicated than just, you know, providing that sort of surface. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of rocks that are the size of the eastern Olympio on the mm -hmm. bottom. Unfortunately, they tend to get tumbled. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Does anybody else have uh, any questions for anybody here? I, I wanted Michelle to be very, uh, I, I, as a young man, used to fish the Susquehanna in Oneonta all the time, and I caught many hellbenders. And the question I have for you, Michelle, is when they eat a worm, which they, they, they do, how should you attend to releasing them? They don't just get caught in the lip. They eat it. They're like a catfish. It's down in their gut. So uh, what's your best advice? Should we be cutting the line off as close to their snout as possible? Should we be trying to remove that hook? Yeah, that is a, a tricky question to answer. Um, I've heard advice leaning towards either, like you should just uh, cut it as close as you can. Other people say you should try to get the hook out, but um, I, I don't know. I would guess depending on how deeply the hook is lodged, it's maybe you would cause more harm than good trying to extract it. So it's it's a little bit of a judgment call on your part, I suppose, but yeah, here's, uh, that's my we, best answer. <laughs> we do have, uh, Peter has said he can answer that question. Yeah. So I'm gonna- yeah, Peter I'm gonna, is our, our hellbender uh, expert. Yep, I'm gonna give Peter the uh, opportunity to talk here. Go ahead, Peter. Okay, sure, uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. I've done this many times. Hellbenders have an eversible stomach. So if you pull on the hook with the fishing line and you can pull the stomach out, then you can take a pair of wire cutters and cut off the hook and remove it. So I've done that many times actually and, and saved hellbenders. But in the worst case, as Michelle said, if you, if you can't pull the stomach out far enough, you can't actually reach the hook then you're going to have to cut the line as close to the mouth as possible and, and hope for the best. So. Thank you. That sounds like something that's very unpleasant for all involved. <laughs> well, you can save one hellbender. It's really worthwhile. Right, right. Um, anybody else? Well, I think uh, with that, we will we'll wrap this up. And I want to thank everybody for coming out, for, for our attendees, and especially for our panelists, Michelle, Paul, and Sarah. Thank you so much for your time. And um, for everybody else, I hope you'll check out some of our other programs over the next couple of days. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this. Yep, thank, thank you. you.